All righty. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody who's logged in from different parts of the world. Uh, hello and welcome to yet another exciting webinar from the Change Leader series, Break Free. Uh, today we'll be looking at seven habits of highly effective test automation teams. Uh, and my name is Dinakar and I'll be the host for today. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you've noticed, your line is currently muted. However, you can submit your questions during the webinar through the chat option uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we will answer your questions as part of the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, and please do note that this webinar is recorded, is being recorded, and we will send out the link of the recording to share with your colleagues later. Now, with that said, uh, let me quickly introduce, uh, let me quickly share a bit about the series. Uh, so, you know, Break Free uh, on our next slide, even as we look at Break Free was, uh, it was an idea that was, that birthed out of the need for change leaders change in the testing domain, right? We have seen the testing industry evolve uh, over the decades as just a few leaders took the risk and embraced change. Uh, however, we believe that this change can be accelerated at a much faster pace, right? Uh, and so we took the liberty of identifying these change leaders and you know, inviting these leaders onto the stage to break the mold and embrace change in the Q&A space. Uh, and that is what became uh, Break Free or Change Leader series. Our hope is that these sessions would spark ideas in each of you to be a change in the QA industry for the better. Uh, with that said, uh, let me quickly introduce our change leader for today, Soumya Sri Taramurthy. <clears throat> Soumya is a seasoned product quality leader. She currently works as an SDAT manager at Leto. She carries 15 years of rich experience in handling products uh, right from inception to delivery. Uh, she, you know, she handles teams and she helps teams build strategies and implementation to achieve ROI through test automation. And being an accessibility advocate, uh, Soumya is keen on driving inclusive software development. Uh, Soumya is also an active member, community builder, and runs the APNs uh, Meet Group from Amsterdam. Uh, Soumya doesn't have cats, so don't be fooled by her handle. But she, uh, she, I mean, she's, she just, she, she used to be called uh, Meow and, and different sorts of names, and that's why that handle stuck. But with that, uh, let me hand it over to our speaker, Soumya. Over to you. I think that was a rich um, introduction already, and quite beefed up. Uh, and I shouldn't be taking pride in again talking about myself, though I'm ogling into my own photo. But then today uh, we will be talking about the test automation, everything about test automation. Having said that, I would like to limit respecting the time of, that we have for this webinar and diving deep into the seven habits that I have worked with the teams who uh, made it work, uh, test, test automation as a whole. We all know there's no silver bullet. We all, we all know that there's no fundamental things that we can say, okay, and put it in the bracket and say, this is gonna work for everybody. But we try and hear out other side of the story just to know people have the same challenges as what I have. And so we're all humans. It's okay to have the problem. It worked for them. So which means it motivates me to go and find some solution which works for me. That's the whole idea of sharing uh, the learnings that we that we have collected over a period of time and today i'll be sharing my experience with regards to test automation with the teams that i have worked with for over the last 15 years and i see uh, i have collected some quite a bit of good you know experience working with some great teams now before i move ahead talking about all the seven points in detail i would like to set the bed of a common understanding during the start of this webinar so when we talk about the test automation, there are so many myths and uh, understandings and theories that goes behind. But when I speak, in my perspective, test automation is nothing but it's not a bug mining activity. Most of them start test automation with an intention of going in search of the bug. It's for our regression. That's not why automation is used. Even if you see in the production industry, automation or automation is basically for the things which are redundant you kind of see happening over and over again. Those tasks are automated. 
not the stuff which needs human skills, cognitive abilities, and uh, human reasoning. That is not possible to automate. So having said that, when we design or come up with a framework, our whole goal is to ensure to check the application's health, not go in search of a bug mining, right? So anything which is not working as expected is a bug. So the idea is we do the health check for the maintenance. If it is not working as per expectation, then it is a bug or a defect. Second is a shared activity. When I started 15 years ago, working with my first team, I remember testing is all about just a bunch of engineers sitting very far away from the development team and doing the testing. And then a slowly agile transformation taking place into the different domains and industries. We see co-located teams, developers, testers, product owners share a same stage. And now there is the furtherance of it where we see it's a shared activity where quality is everybody's responsibility and likewise test automation is also everybody's responsibility there is something from a product owner there is something from a developer for something from a test engineer it's a shared activity the third thing is it's a, it, it's it's like a puppy if you bring a puppy home it needs care it needs uh, love it needs maintenance you know and most of all it needs a lot of patience so is your test automation. So when you start with the test automation, you have to ensure that you are regularly maintaining these scripts, else there's absolutely no return of value that you see and it gets stale. And last but not the least, it's a time intensive activity. I will not dive deep into the fourth point simply because after speaking the seven uh, habits, you naturally will try and find out and connect to this point why I say it is a time intensive activity. Now, we, without further ado, let's go with the First, oh, I slipped this. The first one is a decommissioning of the test. Well, many of us know, and we come across where we speak in various conferences, meetups, it's a general understanding that we have to decommission the test, which means we have to remove the test which is not required from our test suite. Theoretically, it's great, but how many of us are actually doing it practically? Uh, there is upgrade, there is a hot fix, there is a new feature, there is something else, there is more shiny things and then I may have to stretch across all these things. It's okay, I'll come back tomorrow and then clean this up or I'll remove the test. Now let me take one example to explain this. When I come up with the test framework, I usually do it with the action driven test framework. What does it mean? People choose keyword driven, a page object model or data driven, depending on the type of application and the environment setup. There are multiple factors which plays a role. But in my case, I as much try and fix into the action, um, action driven test automation framework, which means every simple atomic action is captured as a part of a function. And each action is called in order to achieve a feature. So my entire test framework drives around this atomic atomic actions. It can be search in its atomicity, uh, adding a product in its atomicity, clicking on a save button. It can be any of these. These are atomic actions to generate the crude operations towards the databases. And that's how I am gonna uh, collect these pearls in a single file and call these actions to form a feature. And this feature can be executed in its, uh, uh, what they say, uh, it can be executed alone, uh, which makes a feature test, and they can be stringed together to form the process integration tests. Now, when we come up with the test automation framework, nowadays, from the last two to three years, you see there's a rise in other form of testings as well, like a visual checks, preliminary performance checks, API tests, A11Y, which is accessibility test. So we are no more restricted to the functionality. We are much beyond that. So we try and beef up our test automation framework, adding in more checks, which is kind of like supplement to your existing functional tests. Now, if this is how complex my test automation framework is, tomorrow my team decides there is something, some action is not required. We're gonna enhancing it to something else. Let me bring in a real world example. When I was working in one of uh, one of the enterprise applications, we were working on a sales and distribution module, and we were heavily on premise. So, which means there is a form which comes up. A user will key in the details, vendor details, item details, the cost of it, and then we're gonna click save, where this data gets saved into the database. Now, this whole feature got upgraded when we moved to the cloud. 
which means we introduced auto save functionality there is no more save button clicking there is no more nothing any such thing happening as and when the key uh, user keys in the data the data is pulled on a regular basis from the back end and it is stored into the database so the whole concept and the feature of this execution is changed when that is the case when my action 4 is about saving something and that is an action it is redundant or I, I i cannot say it's redundant it's not required it's obsolete so a, all the functions that is using it or clicking on the save explicitly does not work uh, the way it should uh, because now we have changed it to auto save so it's anyways gonna change the entire behavior is changed the functionality is changed the back end call is changed uh, so i have to diligently before going on adding some new feature my priority would be to come and check this feature, which is making use of this hey functionality and all the supplement checks that goes along with it, preliminary performance checks, visual checks, accessibility checks, all the relevant checks, supplementary checks, which is, I have added as part of my script also to be eliminated. In this way, um, I keep my code clean. I keep my test automation uh, framework clean and it is always leaner. I don't have to beef up things which is not required. Most importantly, when, when there is a team, you have team members walking in and leaving the team. Anyone who walks in and wants to do some enhancement, puts their hands on, they get overwhelmed with the type of code that we have. Such maintenance, such leaner code helps um, to keep track of an eff effective and efficient uh, test automation uh, within the team. So that's the first one. Let's move on to the second one. The second one is a concept of principle of less is more. I think many um, industry leaders, they always come up with this idea of you have to gain more by doing little less. And I know some of my good friends uh, in the same webinar have addressed some things with regards to testing and I want to bring the same concept towards test automation. What do I mean by this? So when you work in some organizations, some, some application offerings are not just limited to the desktop browser. They are hosted onto the desktop browser. They can be accessed to the mobile native apps. They can come with a progressive web app, which is like somewhere in between. It is not native. It is not a desktop web browser, but somewhere in between, right? Um, and you see the adoption of the mobile solutions is faster as compared to the desktop browser, unless it is absolute necessary to deal with the desktop browser because of the ease um, and the proximity of uh, the device availability is more when it comes to the mobile or tablets as compared to the desktop browser, which is a no brainer. Everybody knows it and our lifestyle have changed over a period of time, not just for the B2B as well as the B2C, uh, B2C and B2B applications. So now if you are a test engineer and you have to cover this spread of tests, for the native mobile apps, for the web applications, for the progressive web app, and everything around it, it can get a little too much onto the plate. But having said that, not every team is blessed with having a separate resource handling, uh, separate uh, tests. I've seen the startups where they do this grand entry of hosting the application into various platforms, and they have hardly two test engineers, three test engineers. Um, and it gets very tricky to manage the tests in such um, setups. But try to portray the types of tests that goes against these browser applications, native mobile apps and progressive web apps. It already looks ugly for me myself. But if you see uh, more closely, look, look towards the desktop browser. There are some functionalities which is specific to the desktop browser and you will not be able to emulate it or see such a behavior in any other uh, hosting like a platform like a mobile. Likewise, a mobile, if you see there are some things which is specifically for the mobile and you will not be able to do justice by emulating it just on some simulators. You have to do it on the device to see uh, and do justice for your testing, correct? Now, this is a little too much. Uh, if you see the entire curve, the caching, OS versioning, uh, I have repeated the viewports there and I'm sorry about that. So how should you approach such a solution uh, and how can you come up with a better test automation strategy is identify the places which is native to it. Like for example, caching. Caching is more native to the web browser and applies to both um, desktop browser and uh, progressive web app solutions. And when you have any tests which is specific for that, surround your tests by focusing uh, those checks onto the web browser. Something like API, this is generic. Whether you use 
mobile app or you use desktop browser the business functional e execution or the the handling of the data the back end or the middle layer is going to remain the same so these things can have a single suite you don't have to replicate the same api tests in every possible way you know how you can group it and how you can degroup it now for example taking the native mobile app security is one major importance when it comes to the native mobile apps i don't want my data to be leaked into other integrated apps just like that it matters to me and having said that the security execution when it comes to the mobile native apps versus the browser applications slightly varies at some points though there are many overlays but there are some places where it strictly follows in a different protocols in these two places likewise uh, the battery consumption you will not be able to emulate this entire thing um, if you're running in a, a simulator but you really have to run it on the device to see how much battery it's consuming and how long it runs and and things like that uh, it's always easier to club things between a desktop browser and a progressive web apps because it's mostly the same browser but the device is what is the difference um, try and group and compartmentalize these things so it helps you uh, to achieve things uh, faster and with the reduced and leaner code now moving to the next one which is a healthy spread of tests now connecting back to my uh, first slide or the first decommissioning of the test you would have seen when we come up with the test it's not just functional anymore you think of how fast it's loading onto the screen how the dom elements are rendered um, which is a visual check so we are supposed to do visual regression and then we check a11y which is uh, accessibility checks we also did a left shift on the performance test by including a preliminary performance checks on some api calls or some crude operations we try and do as much possible so when you check the entire test automation it's not just restricted to checking the business function or the functionality overall but you are also having a supplementary test when this is the case your team is doing a pr which is a pull request pull request is a process where you merge the code with the master repository or the developed branch or something and there is a continuous um, ray of code coming in for the code merge and in your ci cd pipeline you're trying to trigger every possible test in the pipeline you're keeping the agents very busy and the next developer who's ready to push the code have to sit there three hours until all the test runs and the merge happens so we have to be a little more um, smarter in the way we come up with the triggering of these testimers in our ci cd pipeline i've taken two example one is a team who use who generates multiple pr in a day and then one other team who just have one pr in a day so multiple prs i can create my own branch i add my own code i push the code and then the ci tools builds this code which means it also triggers my test into the ci cd pipeline when i do this and there are it's a busy pipeline there are many developers who keeps adding the code i have to be a little more intelligent in reducing my tests you all know how to do it by using tags or by providing the priority depending on what framework you are using you definitely will be having some solutions for that so run only the prio one business checks and prio one api checks no need to run every other possible tests i have seen a team running 500 tests and they had like 6 to 7 prs in a day and all agents were super busy and it was not uh, yielding any results at all. It was not a quick feedback at all. Um, so you have to keep only the prior one checks when there's a multiple PRs going in a day. And then in the nightly runs, when things comes down, everybody logs off, they just go back to their life, is when you can comprehensively trigger the visual checks, end-to-end -end tests, preliminary performance checks, security tests, API tests, wherever possible. All those things should happen at the end of the day when Storm has uh, taken a break and then the next day morning when you come back you can check the comprehensive results of all these supplemental tests uh, in in your ci pipeline and let's not forget if uh, the offering is cross browser and a cross device you're gone for the toss and it definitely should not be part of the execution during the pr build it, it eats up a lot of time i've seen teams do this mistake over and again uh, and they have their theory to prove it but i all i do not encourage that that you trigger a cross browser test during every pr build it makes absolute no sense it has to go into the maintenance part of it mostly you usually during your nightly builds and the last one um, 
So when it comes to the cross device and the cross browser, um, maybe solutions like P Cloudy, who has a device farm, can help you in, in achieving the same and also to achieve the faster results. Let's look at the single PR in the day, which means maybe a senior developer or an architect, they will create a feature branch and all the developers in the team, they branch out from this feature branch. They code the whole day and they merge to this feature branch and this feature branch goes into the develop branch. Like this, all these are a part of a branching strategy, right? So which means at the end of the day, before they log off, they're gonna club the code. If this is the case, then you are a pretty much a free hand, but the catch comes in if you're doing this at the end of the day, like just you want to log off at four, five o'clock and you're trying to merge everything at 4.30. We did this in one of the retail companies that I work with. A uh, very super competitive retail company it was and every day there was a code push happening at 430 and we all used to log off at five so my window was only 30 minutes so when my window is a 30 minutes uh, again i cannot trigger every possible test during that pr build and i have to make an intelligent choice or a smarter choice on what tests i execute when and so that i can get a faster feedback merge the code the rest of the tests of course during the later build uh, to be scheduled at some point in the day now moving on to the to the next one which is a vanilla environment this is a very interesting thing and may not be applicable to everybody here in the room why i say this because you may be working uh, on a legacy applications which is purely on premise or it can be desktop based applications uh, or it can be hybrid cloud applications so in these cases i think you will not be able to harness the benefit of vanilla environment first let me tell you what is a vanilla environment mm, it is an absolute clean clean slate test environment it's freshly brewed freshly spinned up test environment and i think you would have guessed already how you can do this it's mostly using uh, the cloud solutions it may be gcp aws or azure if uh, the applications are hosted there hosted there and your devops has done a job of automating the entire uh, flow of a, a system setup then just in a single uh, button click you will be able to spin up a whole new test environment for yourself and trigger the test so there is some advantages of a vanilla environment you get a clean slate like i said so you don't have to deal with uh, stale data or uh, broken test data or uh, to imagine that maybe someone else logged in and they changed and it interfered into my test automation these are the usual thing that we would see right so we want to have a serene test environment where nobody is touching anything and it, you can continue the execution without uh, any distractions so in those cases this is going to definitely help where you can spin up a test environment on the fly you can spin up another test environment to do your performance test so you have a clean slate and you can perform the tests um in such cases apis come handy and it's usually api driven um because when it is a clean slate you have to set up the entire test bed from the scratch um so you may i don't know there may be some configurations required there may be some uh, test data already set up required at litho we deal with a lot of high density images so our application the basic need is to have some high density images in our applications so i have to first fill in these images before even triggering my tests so the your uh, before each statement will usually be way too busy calling in these multiple apis and setting up this test bed um there is one downside however that in fact two first one being the cost there is the flexibility of spinning up the test environment at any time but there is also a challenge um, uh, that you are very far from uh, the reality um, production systems are not something which is spinned up every day it stays there it's a long living environment so when you are testing on a vanilla environment you are far from the native way of how customers are behaving but most often what happens, some applications need a continuous reset, especially when you're working with a cross um, or a hybrid uh, kind of uh, solutions where you have some part of um, um, a physical applications. It may be a watch or a smartwatch or a mobile or something like that. And it needs a reset every time you have to start execution for those things it can definitely come handy um the second thing is if you forget to tear down this environment then you'll be charged extra um so we have to be very careful while spinning up the tests and also tearing down after all the tests are done data-led automation i cannot stress enough 
this is the new trend and we should like how we have evidence based treatment like you will be asked by your doctor to take mri scan full body checkup blood checks that this and then after seeing all the comprehensive results they say mm, maybe this is a problem so let's let's go ahead treating you uh, in this direction likewise your test automation strategy should be uh, simply sitting in a room discussing okay let's just go ahead this this is a complex functionality and this needs test automation is not the way to drive automation anymore you literally have to collaborate with your data analytics team if you have access to the uh, analytics platform already i think that's the best thing but if not get in touch with your data analytics team try and understand where the customers are logging in more the footfalls how deep they are going how frequently they are going this understanding is very important this image what i am showing you is some rigged data however uh, what you are seeing on the left hand side is from our application where we have where we are using a tags um, and we try and check how frequently customer is using certain part of our application and when it is used some part of our applications are heavily used during the end of the year some part of our applications are used heavily during mid of the year depending on the domain because we serve healthcare education um uh, uh, marketing and design so it depends on the season sometimes it can peak and sometimes it can slow down sometimes we may not have any footfalls at all so understanding my customer behavior makes it very important for me to know prior one prior two in fact we also have to change the priority every six months depending on how it's gonna peak so that is the reason why you have to get back to your data analytics team to check how you can key in and how you can come up with the strategy it's very important not many are actually doing it. So I had to stress it. Two level validation. Well, it's best explained with an example. Let's see. What I have seen people do in automation is you go into a screen, you key in something, you do some action, an event is triggered, something happens, and then a new screen comes up. You validate on this new screen. That's all is automation. Hell no, that's not automation at all. So what you have to do uh, this is this is just record and playback a thing. Uh, test automation should go much beyond level. So when you initiate an action on a screen, yes, you have to check what has changed in the new screen after some action has happened. But it is also important to check your backend calls to your DB. Are the calls going in the right format? Are you having the headers pre-filled? Is it uh, following uh, maybe the, sometimes we even check the time, the turnaround time or the overall time to send these calls uh, to the back end? Are the right endpoints being called? Are these endpoints again hitting the right DB spots? Are the tables being filled properly and the data being sent back? Is the schema right? And is this schema is fetching me the right de details? And are these details being showed uh, in the proper spots in my um, HTML uh, screen? All, this entire check is what makes test automation and this is how it is technically intensive and connecting back to the point where I said it's a time intensive activity. It's because of that. Um, if the idea is to check your screens changing and then asserting and validating, you call that automation? I would say no. It's just a preview. It's good to start with. And I also understand why people connect to that as an automation simply because either you take any YouTube videos or any other sort of uh, courses or tutorials, they kind of restrict you with that understanding that you spin up a framework, you call a screen, you do something and you assert and you're done. It's not. So try and go layers beyond. And that is all the more reason why you have to choose the right framework tool, browser based, browser and application needs a browser relevant framework, backend based, uh, uh codes which is running more closely with the uh, db needs a backend code so this differentiation is very important um, so that you can harness the complete ability of that programming language or the framework in its nativity so having said that coming to the last one which is valuing the history this is a very favorite of mine because i am pretty sure 99 percent of the team would never do this uh, but so that is the main point why I want to bring this here that please do it. Uh, we have to run fast. We have to run leaner. We have to run stronger. But when we do it at some point, we have to pause, take a breath, look back, look at our data and try and mine the gold bits that we have missed over a period of time. We have been performing, but how are we performing is something that you can know only if you look back uh, in the past. 
So this is these are some things that I would like to try and mine from my analytics or the history by running uh, our automation tests. I would like to see what's the impact that I'm trying to create. Is it even fetching? Am I able to find or uh, keep upkeep the maintenance of my application? How frequently am I seeing the false positives? Um, do we have any challenges simply because the screen is changing or we genuinely have issue with our test framework the way we have designed it? What's the percentage of tool usage? I know most of you uh, are happy and would like to do uh, free or open source um, solutions, but trust me, not many uh, enterprise solutions or organization would promote it because safety is must, security is necessary. Usually by and large, they go for the paid tools. It is important. So when we're using and paying the budget for it, you should also import, it is important to know uh, what's the usage that is happening. Uh, so the tool usage is also important. How frequently are you using the speed of execution? If my tests, if my 400 tests are taking 40 minutes, can I cut down some tests? How can I cut down these tests? How can I reduce a test to 20 minutes? Um, how can I efficiently run my test so that I can handle the hooks statement in a better way? All these are some things which I have to always look back and see if I can improve. So I highly recommend people to go ahead and look at your history of the executions, mine some important key parameters, discuss with your wider team how you can improve it. Or if you're already doing great, which is better, it's a good learning curve for you guys. If not, please um, take a look. Now, that's the last, summing up this entire last 25 to 30 minutes. These are the seven valuable points that I would like to leave in this webinar. First is the decommissioning of the test. Do it regularly. I prefer doing it quarterly once. Apply the principle of less is more. Try and achieve more results with less effort as possible by bunching, grouping, and compartmentalizing your tests as much possible. Follow a healthy spread of tests. Uh, don't be too engaged in just doing a business function test. Come, come up with a supplemental test along with the existing uh, functional test so that you're harnessing the entire test spectrum and not restricted to a point. Harness the, uh, the possibility of vanilla environment as, as much possible. It makes your test quicker. It makes your test easy. You can run leaner uh, and you can also tear down whenever it is not required. A data led automation, which is collaborate with your data analytics, uh, analytics team. Even better if you get access to the uh, system so that you can track the customer usage, get to know their emotions behind using our uh, applications, how they interact, how frequently they interact so that you can come up with a better strategy in leading uh, the entire automation suite. Two level validation, do not restrict yourself between two screens. Please check the calls that goes behind and the calls that's coming forward before rendering onto the screen as well. Last but not the least, my favorite, which is valuing your history. Please look back, take a deep breath, uh, pause uh, pause a little while and uh, mine your history uh, for the progressing your automation in towards the better direction. Now, having said that, I think we have come to the last slide. Uh, I'm on these channels, please buzz me. I'm happy to connect and would love to meet people. Um, so I think this is a good time to shower some questions and uh, yeah, can have some Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you're talking, I think you're on mute. Okay. Okay, I'm just looking through a few questions. Um, just keep them coming. I'm just reading a few and then I'll kind of uh, let you know if anything comes in. Sure. There's no question. I will just guess that um, it was the best talk then. <laughs> People understood everything that I had to tell. Sure. So that's way to, that's one way to look at it. Either you understood everything or you understood nothing. Isn't that right? Thanks, Ahil. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, all right. Here's a question uh, for you, Samia. Um, so how frequently should we decommission the tests? Uh, is there a specific timeline uh, that we need to look at? So when it comes to decommissioning of the test, it usually depends on various parameters, like how huge the application is, how frequent changes you guys are doing. Um, um, some teams may do even now uh, quarterly releases. So if it's a quarterly release, decommissioning the test every week makes no sense. So you can literally wait for an year uh, because your test suite is going to change over a period of time. Having said that, looking at the retail industry, you can see every every week or every season something new coming in. So you may have to do this a little more frequently. Um, quarterly is usually suggested. Sometimes monthly ones is even better. So. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So what tech stack are you using in your organization? Um, Raj, we are using uh, Cypress. I think I got involved with Cypress four and a half years ago and uh, I've stuck to this uh, framework for quite long simply because of its capabilities and um, uh, I mean, it's the, the ease and use of it. Um, we try and club uh, the test engineering team and the implementation, code implementation team together, uh, who we call developers. Um, so we both add tests into the same repository and it helps us to keep our browser-led automation using Cypress. Whereas our backend is, uh, when it comes to API, we are still with Postman. Sometimes it's rest assured. Is it a best practice to split the test cases in into a similar piece or including all functionality in one test case? Automicity is the key. The more leaner, shorter, faster, the better it is. So if you can make it as atomic as possible, it is good. I always suggest please split your test cases. Um, in fact, you have a scenario and then you have cases and these cases if you see again can be split into um, a, a smaller steps possible please do it so that it helps in easy maintenance of your code i hope i answered the right thing karthik what about apis and mobile automation uh we don't we have a mobile app but it is not um a heavily used so we have not automated the app yet it is still pretty much we execute on our own um, 30 minutes or 40 minutes a day, we give it a regression test. Uh, when it comes to API, it, we are heavily into Postman and it's working better for us. For point six, that is two level validation, you said that we need to check the backend as well. As you very well mentioned on the training platforms like YouTube or Udemy, we don't get such ideas or implementations. So if you can suggest how we can mindset of what all places we look for such solution for implementation so i can use that in my product and automation in test suite it's a very good question very valid question veena as well i know most test engineers are not given a complete picture of what test automation is and just uh, comparing the actual screen and the change screen and say assert and then we're done with the automation let me tell you in this webinar i think there are some bright minds who will join like sahil who is also uh, into test automation and he's great. Um, I would say get engaged very actively into the testing communities. You have, uh, you can, you get to meet bright minds. They uh, do such webinars and meetups. So you get to learn things faster. Uh, the best way is always to hands on. Somebody is there with you to do it, pair programming. I learned it through my team uh, when I was growing up in my role and that's how it helped me give me a better view of what automation should be uh, but i would say be more active in uh, the testing communities to gain some help from there i hope it helped Vina. if not you can always reach out to me we can find out a way yes so will codeless automation be effective are they capable as much as selenium karthik it's a it's a non-binary answer I wouldn't say yes or no. See, I reside in Amsterdam. For me, finding a test engineer is, is like mining a diamond, right? It's not easy. 
the skills are not easily available here and whoever is available are their costs are like way above uh, way above the roof and not every time i can hire an engineer from the other side of the world to get the things moving in my side so when i when i hire in this market with available talents then i have to also come up with a effective strategy so that test automation works so in that case codeless tools or less um, yeah no code tools definitely help they can pitch in and the advantage is also they get connected with platforms like peak cloudy which is a device uh, device uh, uh, device farm sorry and they also fit into the ci cd pipeline pretty easily but when it comes to the effectiveness i still doubt they can reach to the point that what i am trying to share in this webinar uh in that case we just have to go ahead with the idea something is better than nothing how do you ensure dry code pattern when you work as a team some functionality being implemented by other team members ah communication is the key so if you're working in a scaled agile team i was working in one of uh, the scaled agile team in enterprise solutions when we were uh, coming up with the erp solutions the team was huge right we had uh, four teams in mobile three teams working specifically for on prem two teams were working for cloud so overall in that solution offering if you see we are totally like seven to eight teams in a stretch and we we used to share the same repository to execute our our tests the only thing we could do better was to communicate over communicate have uh, have a regular meetings even before you start uh, the test automation set the ground rules come up with the ground rules um second one a clean guidelines of what you are supposed to achieve how do you come up with the idea of which functionality you should automate and which you should not a common understanding should be established guidelines of the code which is very important i understand setting up a dry knowledge uh, dry uh, principles is not easy because the understanding of the code is at different wavelengths somebody is way too good in putting up the code than me and somebody does not have even any experience so we have to bridge this gap by knowledge sharing sessions within the team this requires time and patience and that is what team leaders are supposed to do in the team whether it's a qa managers or the team leaders of um, of the team have to take up this um uh, responsibility of setting up this common and shared understanding encouraging more open communication uh I hope that helped shankar how to automate an integration environment do you mean an ipas solution um or is it communication of two different applications uh, is that what you mean so see this is what i say uh, i will take an example at lito we have we are integrating with uh, an ipas solution which is not uh, our usual application right and the cypress is not going to support it because of the cost issue in this case i fall back onto my api the most for the for me uh, the value of test is with the api when two applications cross applications are communicating am i sending the right data am i receiving the right data is the first and basic format that i am going to uh, pick it up i don't heavily invest onto the ui especially when it comes to the integrations it's going to fail any time so i always go more nearer to the code to add my api test maybe some contract testings and and things like that uh, and it 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 helps us keep our pipelines sane not running crazy i hope i helped you thanks pranish for the question i have one question with sumit i am in manual testing or production support looking for a job change 9.6 years of experience working in hcl technologies but salary is less 6 lakhs per annum how should i approach to grow um sumit if you don't mind absolutely if you don't mind i run mentoring sessions in the mentoring club this is a very good question i help so many people address this um address such challenges and share my uh, experiences and help you and guide you as much possible is it okay if we can you know catch up in that session so i'll be able to give you a one on one session and help you it's absolutely free it's not charged so it's something i volunteer my time in doing so i think this question fits well there i hope it's okay sumit why did you choose cypress for web automation did you compare with 
any other technologies before choosing that? Good question, Raj. Yes, we did. Uh, Selenium wasn't suiting us. OK, let me tell you, um, at least in Lytho, uh, we have uh, the front end driven in all Angular JS and React JS. Uh, uh, so when we have a JS framework, and if I have to check my UI or a front end for that matter, I would like to go more deeper into the browser uh, calls and then check for the XHR calls, validate some uh, schemas, validate some content headers, which makes it easier for me when I am using the same language as what browser speaks, which is JavaScript. Um, I have worked with WebDriver IO in the past, Nightwatch JS IO in the past, but the ease and ex ease of execution and uh, the way I can tighten up the script, right, is is not easy. Secondly, buying in the vote from the developers to maintain this test automation script in those framework was not easy. It was difficult. But Cypress makes it things easy. We use it for our visual component tests, unit tests, our integration tests, and all other form of checks. It also integrates well with accessibility tests, pre-flight performance tests. So that is the reason why, why we went ahead with Cypress because it, it fits in multiple baskets at a time uh, than as compared to Selenium or any other uh, framework. It, it's just working better for us. There's a lots of buzz around everywhere. The DevOps is going to replace testing. No, I still don't understand how it's going to happen. Hey, who said that Karthik? No, it's never going to happen. Neither robots is going to take over us, nor DevOps is going to kill testing. Testing is going to stay there, but the flavor and the way in which we do is going to change. Like I said, when I started, back in 2008 15 16 years ago the way we used to do test automation using uft is way too different than what we are doing now there's a frog leap like there is the change that has there's a trajectory of learning that has happened over a period of time and also the maturity of applications have changed so nothing is going to replace anything but our mindset and view towards approaching the solution is definitely going to change so in in this whole trajectory we will be challenged to learn something new to fill up this space. That's exactly what's going to happen. Thanks for the question, Karthik. Uh, Shah Sumit will uh, connect over the mentoring club, so it is fun. All right. Um, we we have time for maybe one or two questions, but if not, we can draw it to a close. How many QAs in your place and how do you motivate them? Okay, at Lito, Raj, we have um, five testers in our team, including me six. Um, and how do you motivate them? It's a good question. Um, so, motivation is a very open and vast and wide topic. But as far as I see in my team, uh, my role is having the one on ones to check the challenges that they have. Most importantly is to explain them what is the next logical move that they have to do in terms of learning, in terms of role uh, and understanding their interest. I pretty much know some QA engineers who definitely want to become code implementers, whom we call developers. And I definitely want to motivate them which means there are, I have to identify the skills they have to pick up before they do this transition. Likewise, mm -hmm. there, there are people who have come from prod production support. They have come from different other uh, backgrounds. I have to identify, identify the skills that they need to do the present job and the skills they need to keep afloat in this industry according to the technological changes that is coming in. This alone is good enough to motivate them because there is a purpose that I can fill. Secondly, like I said, communication and collaboration is very important. I stay uh, I stay on top of things which is missing. I try and introduce relevant tools so that it makes their life easier. And as a team together, we also discuss when we introduce tools, how we can use it more efficiently. Having tools is one side, but are you making something out of it is the other one. So some of these things I try and manage and do as much as possible. Hi, Omkar. How are you doing? Thanks for joining this webinar. Great session, Samya. Thank you so much. Uh, we are thick client legacy product. Mm. How do I approach automation for desktop applications? Good question. 
So uh, for desktop applications, I am not into desktop application. I think when I left SAP, that was the last time I worked on on-prem desktop applications. But now things have changed a lot. Like I said, from a technological solutions perspective, there are some tools like Axel Q um, and maybe other tools. I know Axel Q for a reason because uh, uh, I work with them closely on some, some things. So you can look at the low code uh, tools, which are uh, browser as agnostic and run mostly on, uh, on, on OS driven. Um, I, I think I also came across a tool called AskQI, but I, trust me, I have not used my hands on it, but there are tools which runs on OS level rather than uh, the browser based. So these are good solutions for you to do a POC and check if it fits the bill for uh, doing the desktop application automation. Okay. okay, there's one more question from Shankar. Can you help us understand what benefits to testers get by knowing design principles? Oh, where shall I start? It's a, so design principles are important so that um, it meets the point of how to get more out of less, right? And it helps you, it helps you keep your code clean. It helps you structure things better. It helps you build a purpose and perspective in which way you have to build the entire test automation suite. Today I decide I come up with some test automation suite, click some buttons, assertion of the changing in the fields. If this is all what the definition of test automation is, it's better not to have it. It's serving no purpose. So design principles helps you to set a purpose, set a structure, bring a discipline and set up the regular cadence execution in your test automation. See, I'm using a very high level topics and touching simply because respecting the time. Each of these verticals can be dived depth in depth to check how you can achieve it on a day to day basis. And I guess that's the role of our team leader or a manager to do the sessions with the team on a regular basis. Okay, I think that was the last question. I don't know. Thanks, Shankar, for the question. All right. Okay, good. Uh, so if you guys do have any more questions, you can obviously, uh, you know, uh, Samya has been kind enough to, you know, give give the handle and give the access to her personally uh, through her community. Uh, but yes, if you if you do have any questions, uh, just drop a line uh, on our uh, email address or reach out to us, and we'll try and get that answered over an email. Right. Uh, well, uh, this has been a, quite an interactive session, Samya. Uh, we really want to thank you for all your valuable uh, insights and the real-world examples that you've shared. Uh, your, your presentation has given us a lot of practical uh, strategies and insightful uh, experiential knowledge. Right? And it's been a true honor just listening to you and hearing your stories about your experience uh, and drawing those principles out that we can implement in our organizations as well. Right, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everybody right. who joined the session and stayed with me. So have a nice day ahead. Wonderful. Yeah. Cheers. Great. All right. So uh, if you've noticed, Soumya has been on the screen for quite some time now. Uh, but yeah, that's that's some exciting. So here's some exciting news. Uh, we're we're giving away a thousand dollars. We're giving away a thousand dollars to anyone who comes up with an idea or a feature request that we must include in our roadmap. Uh, on the P Cloudy's platforms roadmap, right? It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you've never used the platform or you've been using it for a long time. All that matters is your idea has to be included in our uh, roadmap. It convinces that your idea is, you know, uh, the best, and you earn those thousand dollars for yourself. So we will be sharing out a link uh, where you can to the context and where you can uh, kind of come back and share your ideas. And yeah, or else you can just drop us a line and feel free to connect with us to learn more about that. Great. Uh, well, we also want to thank all our audience or uh, the participants. You've been so kind, so patiently listening to all of this and sharing your questions. Such an interactive bunch, and we've thoroughly enjoyed you as an audience here. And we're sure you know Samia's insights uh, on effective test automation practices have really sparked some ideas uh, that you can take back and implement in your organizations. And that's the goal of these uh, sessions that we're doing at Break 3. So thank you once again for being a great audience and a patient uh, listeners. Uh, good day. Thank you, Samia. Yeah. Cheers.